Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Each week, we address issues of timely and timeless concern with newsmakers and the journalists who report on them, with artists, writers, scientists, educators, social scientists, and government leaders. We meet each one to one. I'm delighted to welcome Glenda Testone to the program today. She's the brand new executive director of the New York City Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender Community Center. She brings years of leadership roles to the 26-year-old organization, the latest as vice president of the Women's Media Center. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. Glenda, just last week, uh, the New York State Assembly voted down uh, a law which would have legalized same-sex marriage in New York State. What are we to make of that vote? Well, <clears throat> it's deeply disappointing. It makes me sad and angry. Anytime a, a group of people's rights are put up to a vote and voted down, uh, it's something that certainly stings. It's not something that's going to stop our community. Um, you know, at the LGBT Center, we see every single day the impact uh, of not having the, that basic equality, the impact that has on our families. Um, we had a lesbian couple that just came in a couple of weeks ago, two African-American women, a small child, a breast cancer diagnosis. They came in with very little safety nets, if any, to protect their family. And luckily, through our free legal clinic, we were able to get them a living will and the paperwork for a second parent adoption and introduce them to a support group. Um, but it's not enough. We help all the people that we can, but even with those things in place, they still are not at the basic level of equality um, that straight families and straight couples have in the state of New York. Why do you think there continues to be resistance to the idea of same-sex sex marriage at a time when, I mean, Iowa, for God's sake, has made it legal? Well, I think it's political. Uh, if people knew us, if they talked to us, you know, I think some of the uh, assembly members spoke very eloquent about we have nothing to fear from Tom. This is Tom, Senator Tom DeWayne and his partner. There's nothing to fear from, from same-sex couples. Um, we need to have more discussion about this. People need to know us. They need to understand that we're not trying to destroy anyone else's family. We just want to live safe and healthy and protected in our own families. And in New York, you said it's, it's, it's political. It may not even be you. It may be, you know, that somebody's angling for, you know, it's, it's Albany. It's always been quid pro quo. Well, you know, maybe they haven't gotten enough in return for, you know, a vote on this particular issue. The, the sad thing about that is we're talking about real people's lives. And I, I, I understand what you're saying, and I hear that from people. When I see that lesbian couple who walk in the door and they just want to protect their child, they just want to have a safe and healthy family. And, you know, it's sad that politics comes into it and really affects people in that way because people need protection now. And we do what we can every day to help them. But in a climate of state-sanctioned discrimination, it's very difficult. Now, it lost by 14 votes. Uh, I know Governor Patterson had been pushing for this, I guess, ever since he came into office. Uh, and I guess the question is, if you would think you would know if you had the votes or not, and if you didn't have the votes, should he have let, the, let it go to a vote? You know, uh, from my perspective, what we try to do at the center is is give people the political tools to push the issues in, in a variety of ways. Sometimes it's inside, sometimes it's outside, sometimes it's now, sometimes it's wait. Um, I, I, you know, and leave the strategy to them. I, I don't want to sort of second guess the strategy. What I, <clears throat> what I will say, what people have said to me, and I, I can agree with, is, you know, we now it, it's clear the people that are uh, standing in the way of equality for LGBT families in the state of New York. Um, I would say all of the um, assembly members that voted against the bill, they certainly need to know that they have LGBT people in their districts who are not going to stand for this kind of discrimination and we now know exactly who they are. And are you trying, I mean, going forward, are you trying to, is your organization going to wage an effort to, to um, 
activate those those voters? You know, we give people the tools and we work with organizations um, at the center. We work with organizations like the Empire State Pride Agenda um, that really decides how, how we're going to mobilize people. I can tell you that we have 300,000 people annually who come through the center and they are absolutely voters, the people that show up at rallies and the people that take these issues very seriously. And what we do at the center is to make sure they have the information and the tools to advocate in the way that they, they want to for their families politically. Probably a lot of viewers are not familiar with what the LGBT does, so why don't you tell us about what, what the group does? Well, we're, um, we were founded in 1983. Uh, we are the Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Community Center, and we are essentially the home and the heart for all things LGBT in New York City. Um, for anyone out there, wherever people are on their journey, whether they're coming out, finding a social circle, trying to meet a partner, trying to get a job, get healthy, um, soak up our culture or celebrate our lives, there's something for everybody in the LGBT community at the center. Mm -hmm. um, we provide direct services, we have outstanding cultural programs uh, where we bring different people um, who are at the top of the game into the center to really talk to the entire community. We do education, we do substance abuse prevention and recovery, um, we have a lesbian cancer initiative where we provide support um, for lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people who are dealing with a cancer diagnosis and don't always get the most sensitive support um, for dealing with that diagnosis. We have youth programs. It goes on and on. I, I think the foundation of everything we do is we try and help people live better lives. Mm -hmm. um, and the center really draw, does draw people from the tri-state area on a regular oh, basis. Oh, really? Absolutely. Um, you know, I was sitting in on a young woman's group the other day, which is uh, women, primarily I would say most of them are probably between the ages of 16 and maybe 19. Uh, there was a woman who had, a young woman who had traveled on a bus two hours to get to the center to come to this meeting um, because she gets so much. they don't much, have anything like that at home. No. Near, near by. No, they don't. They don't. And a lot of people from all over the area come on a daily basis to the center to find their community and find support. And you said 300,000? 300,000 a year, 6,000 people a week, 300 groups a week. What's the demographic like? I mean, are young, old, ethnic group? Um, it's an excellent question. It's really across the board. Okay. Uh, I'm uh, amazed when I walk into the center, you know, the, the diversity of people that I see in terms of age, race, class, mm -hmm. um, education. Uh, there are just so many different things going on. And we really do try and provide a place where wherever people are, in their journey, in their lives, at that moment, um, as members of the LGBT community, they can find resources and support and something to make their life even better at the center. Um, I think as you said before, you previously worked at GLAAD, the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation, yes. which under your leadership brought about some significant changes at the New York Times. Tell us about that. Well, I was a, a member of a small group of us that went and met with the Times and tried to convince them to run same-sex wedding announcements in the New York Times. And we really did it as, as an issue of fairness and equality. These unions are happening. People are, are getting married. Um, this, this is... This is really something that is out there in the community, and by not covering it in the same way, um, you're really making a decision that this is less than. So the New York Times agreed with us and agreed to run the union announcements, and what was so interesting from that decision was the New York Times is, is such a leader, um, and we were able to take their decision and talk to newspapers across the country right, and get right. them to run wedding announcements. Now, wasn't that group influential? I wasn't there a time when the New York Times refused to use the word gay? And and True. we're glad was I think instrumental in getting them to use that. I don't know what you what I hate to think what word they used before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they um, you know I think. Uh, uh, you know, who knows, they were using the word homosexual and we did okay. get them to use the word gay okay. um, because it really explains who we are. Mm -hmm. What did you learn from uh, the experience with negotiating with the Times? I think I learned, I learned something about, about leadership. Um, that there are allies out there that are willing to stand up for us and take a stand and do what's right. And you know, it was a it was a really proud moment when that decision came down. 
Not as much because the New York Times was going to print our union announcements. I believed that would happen. I wanted that to happen. But because I knew that I could take that and go back to the Syracuse Post Standard, which is what my parents read right. every day and have read every day for the past, you know, 65 years, um, and that one day they would see wedding announcements in that paper. And I hope one day they'll see my wedding announcement mm -hmm. in that paper. It, it just was it told me something about equality and the discussions we had all across the country based on that papers in you know North Carolina we worked for years to get even one paper in Mississippi to run these announcements and I'm proud to say that that eventually glad did make that happen how did you get into the business of being an activist on behalf of gay lesbian bisexual and transgender people well, I would say this starts with my parents. You know, um, my mother was actually the assistant director of an African American community center in Syracuse, New York, for most of my childhood. And my father was an educator. He was a school superintendent in upstate New York. And I always believed in helping other people in the community. I would challenge people if they told racist or sexist jokes. My classmates, I was, um, you know, would go to school board meetings and talk on behalf of preserving arts and um, sports funding and teacher salaries. And I think it's something I was raised on. When I got to college and took my first women's studies class, I saw things in a much broader perspective. I understood issues and that sometimes people were discriminated against, you know, based on things that were beyond their control and, and really got involved um, in anti-racist, sexist, homophobic movements. And uh, when I got the job at GLAAD and, and saw firsthand the kind of ignorance and discrimination that LGBT people faced, uh, that's when I made a decision to really spend the rest of my life fighting um, so that we have equal rights. Do you find a lot that, that there's still a lot of bias uh, in terms of sexual against people with a different sexual orientation in the media? Oh, I do, absolutely. I, I mean, we have, there's a lot of consumer culture that celebrates some parts um, of the gay community. There's the Bravo network and every show on that network, you know, seems to have a gay, a lovable gay character. Um, Tyra Banks had a transgender contestant on America's Next Top Model. So we're making strides, but there's also clearly a double standard. You know, Adam Lambert, when he um, kissed one of his male backup dancers, his appearances were canceled from ABC, both on Good Morning America and on Jimmy Kimmel. So they're, they're, we're not there yet. There yeah. still is a lot of homophobia um, in the media that prevents equal treatment and equal representation. The numbers are not, um, not the same. And reflective of the population. We're going to take a short break. We'll be back with more with Glenda Testone, Executive Director of the New York City Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender Community Center, right after the following message. Hi, how are you doing today? Uh, what looks good? Our special today is shrimp scampi. It's been sitting around for about a week. Excuse me, what time are you guys leaving? We're gonna rob your house tonight. Don't you wish there were warnings to protect you from life's risks? With diabetes, there is one. It's called A1C, a simple blood test that helps measure your risk of serious complications. Learn more at diabetesa1c.org. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm talking with Glenda Testone, the Executive Director of the New York City Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender Community Center. Where does your funding come from? Individuals, uh, government grants, foundation grants, events, uh, like any nonprofit, resources are very tight right now. Mm -hmm. um, we need all the support we can get. Um, are you foreseeing Addition, additions to your program? We have a real opportunity in the area of families. Um, what, the program that we run, which is called Center Kids, Center Families, mm -hmm. sees about uh, 20, has seen about 2,500 families come through our program. It's um, one of its kind, really, throughout the country uh, in terms of 
that we provide services uh, for LGBT families. We provide support. We provide information. Um, you know, I was just talking to the director of the program who was saying it's, it's sort of like an information swap meet. Mm -hmm. um, we run meetings every week for wannabe dads, wannabe moms um, who are trying to have a family. And we, had, we have those added obstacles and hurdles that lesbian and gay and bisexual families, uh, transgender families need to need to jump in order to create our families. Right. Is health, insu is, is health insurance one of your issues? Absolutely. Health disparities are huge for our community. Um, we have a lot of programs at the center where we address this. Um, wellness programs, center wellness, uh, we do um, we do substance abuse clinics, HIV prevention, and support groups for those living with HIV and AIDS. Uh, we do, uh, we address a lot of health concerns, but the climate, changing the climate is something we also work on through different committees and commissions where we make sure, we wanna make sure that health professionals are trained to deal with uh, LGBT patients and, and clients. Is your constituency affected by the lack of universal health insurance in ways that other groups are not? Absolutely. You know, we face, there's a barrier to getting LGBT people sometimes to even see health professionals because they imagine that they will face <coughs> misunderstanding and bias. And too many LGBT people have tried to access uh, health care and experience that, whether it's an emergency situation or a routine visit. Mm -hmm. um, so it's something that, that we're working on all the time having a financial barrier um, to seeking those services is, is something that, that everyone faces without universal health care. Um, but LGBT people have the added barrier of feeling like they're, they may not face competent health professionals who are going to be able to deal with who they what are. What kinds of experiences do they have? For example, are it just people who are just hostile to uh, people who are gay or bisexual or transgender? or How does it play out? I think it plays out, there's a lack of information. Um, people who just don't understand, you know, we, I was at a lesbian cancer initiative meeting and one of the ways that it plays out, there is <coughs> there is a, a good amount of, of support um, for women, for example, who are living with cancer. A lot of the support groups unwittingly can be very heterosexist. A lot of talk about husbands and boyfriends and appearing sexy to your male partner. Well, lesbians that are dealing with a cancer diagnosis feel alienated from that. And the last thing you wanna do is, is face homophobia when you're trying to access support. So right. that's why we have a program dedicated to giving support and, and really supporting the, the whole person for lesbians, bisexual, and transgender people that are dealing with that cancer diagnosis. Aside from the legalization of same-sex marriage and health insurance for everybody, um, what would you say are some of the other priorities of your organization in well, terms of issues? In terms of issues, I mean, health, families, the two issues we just talked about, those are huge. Making sure we have the protections and support to create our families, making sure that we have equal access to health care and that health care professionals are educated about how to deal with our community and, and really make sure that, that we have access to all of that information. The other things are living life, a life free from violence. Um, we experience far too many people that come to the center that have experienced violence and continue to um, experience violence because they are LGBT. Um, you know, we are doing a program for veterans uh, who are coming home who are LGBT and can't be openly themselves in the military because of the don't ask, don't tell policy. What we do at the center is try and provide services and support for everybody regardless of what's going on legislatively or in the legal arena. Um, people need help now and that's really what we focus on. But we also try and educate people and leverage their collective voice about, well, what can we do to change the climate to make this better for all of us. I ride my bike down uh, along the Hudson River bikeway. Mm -hmm. And right around Christopher Street in the parks along there, I've noticed that uh, there are often groups of young African-American, mm -hmm. sometimes mostly male, sometimes women, who appear to be um, you know, gay or possibly transgender um, hanging out there. And I often wonder who they are where they live, yeah. how they make a living, yeah. what their lives are like, uh, which I would think would be 
in terms of what their lives are like, I would think it would be somewhat difficult if, you know, if you are presenting in that way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm just wondering, is this a group that you work with or do you reach out to this Absolutely. Population. We, uh, the program at the center is called the Youth Enrichment Services and we provide support and activities and growth opportunities um, for young people aged, you know, 16 all the way up to 21 uh, to make sure that they're fully supported in their development. We have a, a, a crisis right now with homeless LGBT youth. Um, and I fear that many of the people that you see when you're riding your bike don't have a place to call home. Um, the demand for housing and for services is far outpacing the resources and, and the services we have to provide these young people. Between ourselves and some other organizations in the city, we do the best we can to really provide provide for those people and, and make sure that they have the resources to get their basic needs met, which is something we know increases and becomes even more dire in, in this economic climate, um, but to also make sure that they are fully supported in their development um, and that they can be who they are and, and explore who they are in an environment that's safe and healthy and encouraging. So that's what we do. Now, I in, in the past, I've done stories uh, about and talked to people from the Harvey Milk School. Is that still Absolutely. going strong? Absolutely. They're a great partner of ours. Um, it's interesting, it, you know, if you take one of those young people that you might see, their day might look something like go to high school at the Harvey Milk School, then go to the center and go to the YES program, and then end up, um, you know, g calling home and, and going to sleep at the Alley Fournay Center, which mm -hmm. is an LGBT homeless youth center. Right. So we really, and the center fills an important <laughs> gap. We're open every day from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m., and I often see you know, young people that I see at Harvey Milk or I see at Alley Fournay that are that are ours during the day, and I I shudder to think where they would go if we didn't have the center. And, and in terms of employment, where do you work if you're a 19 year old gay male, and and, and if, if, mm -hmm. if you're black on top of that, yeah. gay male who presents in at, perhaps in a, what people would call an effeminate manner, who hires you? I mean, where do you how do you make a living? Well, job, we do have job fairs at okay. the center. Um, we had a fair recently where in five hours we drew 3,000 people. There was a line down 7th Avenue, um, and I know a lot of people that made really valuable connections from that. We do have college fairs for the young people that we have at the center, um, and we had 40 different colleges tabling. And we really try and push people to think beyond their limits and to not uh, just think about, well, I could get a job at McDonald's. Maybe that's where the job ends up being, but there are other options. And so we really try through a lot of our programming to give young people the vast array of options. One of the great things that I love about the center is that we can look at these issues in their complexity. We can look at race and class and, you know, a status of um, jobs and home and all of those basic needs and have the opportunity to address them. We have a a long-standing gender identity program um, where we have support groups for masculine identified individuals and feminine identified mm -hmm. individuals and in those support groups people really explore and talk about the discrimination they face and talk about the process that they're going through and get resources and accurate information all along that journey. Since AIDS has become less a, of a fatal disease and more of a chronic disease you hear less about it you read less about it mm -hmm. is that a good or a bad thing? Oh, I would say it's a bad thing. Um, AIDS is is still absolutely an issue, and and it's a disease that we need to deal with. Um, something we need to talk about because we know that one of the anecdotes is to talk about it, is to have that information and and have it out there. And because it it is more manageable, um, doesn't mean that we should stop trying to prevent it. And that's something that we do every day um, through a lot of the services that we provide at the center. Do you have lawyers on staff to help with legal issues uh, involving your we do, through our partner Science. organization, do some things like free legal clinics, like I talked about in the beginning. We don't have lawyers on staff, but um, we do work with, 
I would say almost all of the other organizations in the city that help with LGBT issues to make sure that when people come through our door, we have an accurate referral or we create a program. So many of the programs at the center started because there was a need. You know, we noticed a lot of women who were coming to the center saying, you know, I'm dealing, my partner has cancer and I'm, I'm just not feeling supported in these support groups thereby grew the Lesbian Cancer Initiative. A lot of you know gay men who are saying, I wanna use a surrogate to have a child, but I have no idea how this process goes. Right. And then we started a program based on that. So there are many things. We noticed smoking was a huge issue in our community, and we have a very successful smoking cessation program geared specifically towards our community and the climate that our community is trying to quit smoking in. Right. Where do you think we are on the continuum of being able to understand and accept people's and their lifestyle choices? I know it's a big question <laughs> for well, a short time. I believe that we are faced with huge opportunity and promise. Um, as myself, a lesbian, you know, talking to my friends and my peer group, talking to people older than me, younger than me, everywhere in between, um, I, I think we're on the right track and we're going to get there. What we need to do is keep our community close, keep helping each other, and keep fighting. Um, this ver marriage vote is is not a uh, roadblock, it's a hurdle that we need to get over and we need to keep going. Well, certainly this is the big civil rights issue of, of our day. You know, I've been through a few. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the current one. Yes. I want to thank Glenda Testone, thank uh, Executive Director of the New York City Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender Community Center for joining us today. For the City University of New York and One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy. If there are any people you'd like to hear from or topics you'd like us to explore, please let us know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.